Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the CBD Search for Our Media. Thank you for coming out this evening. It's lovely to see a great crowd. Uh, my name is Neil Perez de Costa. I'm Associate Dean of Research here at the Conservatory. And it's a really great pleasure to have Julio Vidal with us here. Um, he studied at the University of Graz and Zurich, and I'll explain it in a second. He's going to be talking about playing Scala here on the piano, and his PhD research is about reconsidering Scala reception and also finding out much more about performance practice, particularly in the 19th century. And I have the pleasure of being on his supervisory team, and that's kind of why he's out here because he's been here for three weeks doing some work with me, and um, it's just such a privilege to see all this evidence, and I'm learning a huge amount of myself. But I want to tell you a little bit about him. He was born in 1985. He studied piano at the Cavalier Conservatoire in Italy, where he had recently been appointed piano professor. After graduating, he continued his training in Paris, Rome, Berlin, and Zurich. He is prior to several competitions, such as the Concorso Casa Grande in Bern, Jose Iturbi in Valencia, and Tbilisi International Piano Competition. He's performed all around the world, including at the Salle Porto in Paris, Concert House in Berlin, the Grand Theatre de Provence in Aix-en-Provence, the Palau de la Musica in Valencia, CCK in Buenos Aires, Oriental Art Centre in Shanghai, and many other places too. And he's recorded music by Gabriel Corre and Enrico Scarlatti for the French label Aparte, and Virus Fiji for Eddie Dance. In 2018, he received a special award from the Argentinian Critics Society. And as I say, he's currently doing PhD research in Graz and Zurich. So this is going to be a wonderful uh, lecture demonstration. I'd like to welcome you to the stage. Well, thank you. Good evening to everyone. I'm very glad to be here in Sydney for this lecture on Scarlatti. And I wish to thank Professor Perez da Costa and the Sydney Conservatorium of Music for the invitation. Let me start by a few words about my background. As Neil has explained, I'm attending a PhD in musicology, both in Graz and in Zurich, and I'm very thankful to these institutions which have supported my travel to Australia. I am also a pianist, and in this quality, I have visited in 2012 Sydney as a contestant of the Sydney International Piano Competition of Australia. The title of today's lecture is very similar to the one I have chosen for my dissertation. In this title, Clementi and Landowska embody the two edges of my investigations. The former, was the first to specifically edit Scarlatti for the fortepiano, and the latter, the pioneer of Scarlatti recordings on the harpsichord. During this time span, which roughly goes from 19, 1790s to 1930s, Domenico Scarlatti's sonatas were adapted both in regard to textual issues and to performance instructions. The main aim of the editors, among whom uh, Clementi, Czerny, Liszt, Bülow, Tausig, Clara Schumann, Godowski, Friedman, Granados, Bartok, and many, many others, was to align these works with the developments of the new instrument and of the aesthetics. My research is thus reception-oriented and entails three different domains. The dissemination of Scarlatti sonatas across Europe, the textual criticism of Scarlatti sonatas in the historical editions, and the critical assessment of performance instructions and of historical recordings. Today's presentation is structured on these three domains, and I will also introduce some case studies. For the first domain of my investigations, I aim to demonstrate the uninterrupted presence of Domenico Scarlatti works in performance repertoire. 
the popularity of other composers was more discontinuous. For example, during the second half of the 18th century, Johann Sebastian Bach was much less popular than his two sons, Carl Philipp Emanuel and Johann Christian. Quite the opposite, Domenico Scarlatti's fame remained steady over the centuries. To verify this hypothesis, the main methodology is the analysis of documentary sources. An initial overview of the dissemination of Scarlatti sonatas is seen in this chronological catalog or historical editions. As you will notice, increasing rates of Scarlatti prints of a specific time frames are evidence of increasing interest in and dissemination of the composer's repertoire. Let's consider now only early publications. The top line of this table shows the first and only official publishing of Scarlatti. Scarlatti had it published in London and not in Spain where he was living under the title Esercizi per il Gravicembolo, Lessons for the Harpsichord. This edition featured only 30 sonatas over a corpus of almost 600 items. The other entries are all pirate editions or reprint. And as you can see, the role of the unauthorized edition was crucial for the dissemination of Scarlatti repertoire. By the time of Scarlatti death in 1757, as many as 18 pirate editions had been printed. At a first glance, the prevalence of English publications is striking. Charles Burney, in his General History of Music, published between 1776 and 89, also provides some indications about the performers, which were at the time a considerable number. For these reasons, scholars have referred to this first wave of popularity as the English cult of Domenico Scarlatti. Within 50 years of the composer's death, Vienna became the main hub of Scarlatti editions. But evidence points out that Scarlatti repertoire was already widespread across the old continent and performed in concert. In this regard, more specific information may be found in concert program databases, performance letters, and periodicals. I will now give you a hint of the evidence we can mine in these sources and consistently with my aim of demonstrating the uninterrupted presence of Domenico Scarlatti in performance repertoire, I will take into consideration different time spans. At the beginning of my research, I was very surprised about how many romantic composers included Scarlatti in their concert program. These included Liszt, Brahms, Clara Schumann, and many, many others. A recent study by Thomas Sinovzik of Clara Schumann's concert programs informs that across 1300 performance, she included Domenico Scarlatti more than a hundred times. Brahms as well included Scarlatti in his programs, often combining his sonatas with works by Johann Sebastian Bach. Here are some of their concert programs. The first document concerns a concert by Clara Schumann given in London in 1884. As you notice, the name Scarlatti is preceded by the generic title 
three pieces for pianoforte alone. The second program informs us about a concert by Johannes Brahms in 1868. And here as well, Scarlatti name is preceded by a generic title, Capricen, which means capricious. A third document, witnessing a much earlier performance by Clara Schumann given in Munich in 1857, enables us to identify the sonatas. This time, the name of Scarlatti is preceded by the mentions Tempo di Bacca and Allegrissimo. Such evidence points to the popularity of specific sonatas, a topic that I will discuss shortly. But unfortunately, such evidence is rare to find at this time. The analysis of the performance letters also provides vital information about the dissemination of Scarlatti sonatas. However, these documents must be approached with care. Here is an example. With reference to a letter written by Brahms to Clara Schumann in 1856, musicologists have often concluded that throughout his life, Brahms remained lukewarm towards Scarlatti's music. This is the incriminating passage. I am not necessarily fond of Scarlatti. But this depends on the similarity of his works in form and character. I enjoy playing individual pieces. This excerpt suggests that the 23-year-old Brands was not so keen on Scarlatti. However, this might not be a truthful representation of his opinion. In fact, another excerpt from the same letter suggests an alternative reading. I happen to have at the moment a good volume of Scarlatti. Now think of the difference between owning the Cherny edition or this magnificent old one. Brahms owned a copy of the first edition of the Esercizi per il Gravicembalo and was seemingly proud to own it this was already, at the time, a very rare volume, and quite possibly, Brahms spent a large sum of money to purchase it. However, the front page of the volume, beautifully engraved by Fortier, was missing, and this would explain why the young Brahms could afford to buy it. So Brahms replayed it with a note in his own hand. In the same letter to Clara Schumann, we also noticed that Brahms had initially valued the first volume above the one by Czerny. Here as well, we should not jump to hasty conclusions because other documents indicate that Brahms later changed his mind, perhaps realizing the value of Czerny's indications. This is evidence in several letters by Brahms some 20 years later, and here are two relevant examples. In this letter, Brahms advises his friend Elisabeth von Herzogenberg to acquire a copy of this edition. And the letter also witnesses the efforts Brahms made to cease this publication. Some months before, he had seemingly praised Czerny's edition with the publisher Fritz Simrock. You can read that Brahms describes it as an excellent edition and as a treasure. By this time, Brahms had already become an eager collector of scores and possessed a considerable number of Scarlatti editions. Among these, the most important is the set of manuscripts previously owned by the Albert Santini. 
Grams created in his own hand an index for each of these volumes, marking the tempo, the key, and the incipit of each sonata. He also meticulously compared this manuscript to Czerny's edition as evidenced by his penciled annotations, which can be found in both sources. Another letter to Fritz Simrov gives us a hint about Bram's intentions. This excerpt suggests that Brahms annotations may well have been the first stage to a new edition. And Brahms was probably suggesting Simrock to take the publishing upon himself. All these documents not only contradict Brahms' first statement that he was not so keen on Scarlatti, but present him as an advocate of the Neapolitan composer. A last element to corroborate this picture is the number of Scarlatti sonatas that Brahms copied out and sent to his friends. 14 sonatas were copied out for Clara Schumann, who later included 10 of them in her own edition. And another item was copied out and sent to Elisabeth von Herzogenberg. In addition to performance letter, another valuable types of documentary sources are periodicals. Mining sources in periodical could undoubtedly produce a comprehensive view on Scarlatti's dissemination over a long period of time. But this may well become my work beyond the PhD. But for the purpose of my PhD, a valuable process is to examine specific information about specific celebrated pianists for which there is clear evidence of their performing style. As an example, I want to discuss now a case concerning Clementi, who was, as I mentioned, the first to specifically edit Scarlatti for the piano. In 1780, Clementi left England for a concert tour. He first stopped in Paris, where the appreciation of the Queen Marie Antoinette won him a great success. Then he headed to Vienna, where he performed in the famous musical duel against Mozart, and then headed back to France, where he fell desperately in love with one of his students. In 1784, a Swiss periodical, the Magazine de la Musique, reported that the love affair was ill fated And the Swiss chronicler gives also some details which are crucial for my research, sharing his impressions of Clementi's performance. I have never heard Domenico Scarlatti's sonata played the way Clementi does. I could say I only half knew them before. What a great enthusiasm. But what information can we infer from this text? Well, first, Clementi was an outstanding interpreter of Scarlatti sonatas. And secondly, Scarlatti music was already performed in Switzerland and abroad around 1780. The same year of the Swiss article, Le Journal de Paris advertised a new print by the publisher Bayeux, featuring, among other works, two sonatas, one by Clementi and one by Scarlatti. Two months later, the same announcement appeared in Le Mercure de France. And I will translate it for you. What makes this collection extremely valuable is the sonata by Domenico Scarlatti, which Monsieur Clementi played so successfully after his own ones. And here is the sonata, and I will play an excerpt.
This is still nowadays a very popular sonata. The first record we have of it is from the 1770s and is one of the two prints by the English publisher Johnson. At this time, Clementi was settled in England and he may well have been the one who disseminated the work across Europe. As a matter of fact, after Bayeux, the work was reprinted in France by another editor and was later included by Louis Adam in his Méthode du Conservatoire. Another celebrated piano teacher, this time in the second half of the 19th century, edited his work, and I'm referring to Theodor Leszczycki, who had it printed for Rather around 1890. And we also know that Clara Schumann played it in her early concerts. The source of this information is a Danish publisher who again tried to take an advantage by associating the work with the interpreter. The sonata is printed as Sonata pour le piano, exécuté par Madame Clara Schumann. This sonata became extremely popular and perhaps was the most representative work of the composer. In the respect to this information, information can be found in prefatory sources with each proves illuminating. The document I'm referring to is the preface of Scarlatti edition of 1864 by Hans von Bülow who was exasperated by the current lack of variety in pianists' repertoire. And this is the document, and here we can read that even though Karl Czerny had issued an edition of 200 of Scarlatti sonatas, in Bülow's word, the piano's music tests, as before, unfortunately only accommodate the three most popular works by Scarlatti, which were Tempo di Ballo, Sonata in A, Clara's favorite, and The Cat's Fugue. So what might Bülow have considered a winning formula in terms of broadening pianist's repertoire? He published a new edition selecting 18 sonatas from the Czerny edition and arranging them in groups based on key signatures to four, three, six piece suite. In these new configurations, the term sonatas was often replaced with the name of the dance with which Bülow associated the music. For example, Sarabande, Courante, Bourré. None of these names were ever used by Scarlatti. Many of these sonatas retained its title for many years. The name Burlesca can be found in plenty of concert programs. For example, in 1895, Albenitz played a Burlesca in Giga by Scarlatti and the French composer Vincent Dandy even recorded Scarlatti's burlesca onto a reproducing piano roll. More recently, I have produced a commercial recording based on the Bulo edition, which had not been done before. I was looking for something new, and the Bulo edition gave me inspiration for my own interpretation. As part of my project, I made a second recording of each of these sonatas, this time experimentally applying mid-18th century performance practices. I will now demonstrate one of these sonatas, the first, the last in Bülow edition. Scarlatti sonatas have generally a binary structure in which both halves are Repeat it. This allows me a chance to undertake an interesting experimentation. 
I am to play the first part based on a model critical addition and the repeat based on Hugo. quite sure that you have appreciated the difference between these two versions. The difference between the text leads to the second domain of my investigations, the development of Scarlatti's texts in historical editions. Okay. This domain will also be investigated with specific regard to Scarlatti reception. I will ask why the text was modified and what editorial criteria were shared by editors living in the same area or in the same period. In pursuing this aim, I will adopt the standard methodologies of 
philological analysis, starting with mining the data in documentary sources. First, I collect the historical scores and catalog the information relevant to my research. For example, year of publication, name and biographical information of the editor, etc. Then I proceed to the collection and comparison of different readings. And subsequently, from the analysis of the collected information, I will reconstruct the family tree of the editions and determine the lineage, the stemmata, of each sonata. This process is very important because it enables me to establish which editor has deliberately modified the text or else has simply transmitted a version already modified in the past. Then I will proceed to the exegesis of these modifications and I will hypothesize the reasonings behind. This process is really very exciting. And I will now explain why. Let's take under observation the sonata I have just played. In addition to the two versions you have already heard, which I've reminded, it's the modern critical edition by Kenneth Gilbert and the edition by Hans von Bülow, I will also consider the edition by Karl Czerny, which was the model for Bülow's one. As you will see, Scarlatti's intervention are less invasive than Bülow's. So, shortly after the introduction, Scarlatti introduces a sequence of repeated notes, evoking a mandolin accompaniment. Here is how it appears in the modern critical edition. Introduce contaminations 
In fact, Scarlatti himself, a few months later, introduced this element alien to the Baroque tradition. which is Scarlatti performance practice across the 19th century. So short, no, no, this is, so. Tracing the evolution of Scarlatti performance practice is challenging and requires close consideration of information in edited editions. This information can be analyzed and interpreted in the context of performance practice advice in pedagogical treatises and with reference to period instrument performance. This and the reading between the lines of Scarlatti's notation was expected in rendering highly artistic and beautiful performance during the 19th, the 18th and the 19th centuries. The analysis should also take into account the growing concern that editors had to produce didactic editions preserving expressive practice in Scarlatti's performance. As a matter of fact, if we go back to the 18th century, we find fewer performance instructions in the editions. Does this mean that 18th century performance kept more strictly to the score notation than 19th or 20th century interpreters? 
This is unlikely given the evidence in pedagogical treatises of the time, some of them produced by editors of Scarlatti, as Clementi or Cerny. As the treatises of the 18th and 19th century indicate, performers were expected to embellish the score with all sorts of expressive practices. The evidence points to a continuum of practices as discussed, for example, by Clive Brown and Neil Perez da Costa. There is no good reason to disregard the markings in 19th century editors simply because these editions made modifications to the text. In fact, this instruction provides very important evidence of performance practice of the time, which could have very possibly been similar to those expected by Scarlett. Since the turn of 20th century, modern philology has encouraged perform to consider Scarlatti's and other composers' manuscript markings as authoritative in terms of performance ideals, when in fact Scarlatti's manuscripts are generally devoid of what he expected in performance. Now, let's turn our attention to the earliest edition to contain added performance instruction. Clementi edition from 1791. We notice Dynamics, slow indications, and accentuation. And accentuation. Interestingly, Clementi gave no indication of tempo fluctuations. Does it mean that this sonata was meant to be played strictly in tempo, but Clementi would have played it strictly? in tempo? The answer is almost certainly no. Telling evidence in support of this is given by the aforementioned Swiss chronicler. We can read there, Clementi played with great enthusiasm, crescendo and diminuendo, with rallentando and rubato, in such a way that it would have been impossible to mark it down on the score. This extraordinary information points directly to the fact that, though not marked in the score, tempo fluctuations were part and parcel of professional artistry. The quick glimpse we have had of Cherny's and Bülow's editions illustrates the change in editorial habits and editors growing concern for detailed performance instruction. The advent of sound recordings at the turn of the 20th century provides ear witness evidence of the performance style of trained 19th century musicians. These provide evidence that some pianists added much expression to Scarlatti sonatas than was not indicated in Scarlatti manuscripts. You can hear this in the performance of the celebrated French pianist Raoul Cugno. I thought it would be interesting to compare this with the Louis Ferrand edition of the Sonata, which you can see on the screen, a Urter's Life edition, which was available in Paris during Cugno's lifetime. I have highlighted with colors some of Cugno's performance practices in the score.
performance is highly expressive. He adds dynamics, accent, and tempo modifications. To describe this performance, we could adopt the same words as the Swiss chronicler. He played with great enthusiasm, crescendo and diminuendo, with rallentando and rubato, in such a way that it would be impossible to mark it down on the screen. Another early recording of Scarlatti also points to an old performance tradition. Clara Schumann's student, Ilona Ivanschutz, recorded two Scarlatti sonata in 1903. In both of these performances, Ivanschutz, like Tugno, adds much to Scarlatti's text. I feel certain that Ivanschutz learned the sonata using Tausig's edition, which is the one that you will be seeing on the screen, because she, and she appears to follow the text modifications by the editor. And here is Ivanschutz's performance of Capriccio, as Tausig renamed the sonata. Ivanschutz doesn't follow all of Tausig's instructions, but nevertheless, she plays highly expressively compared with what we usually hear nowadays. Well, while we can't be certain what Scarlatti could have expected, the documentary and early recorded evidence strongly underpins the notion of a continuum of practice from Scarlatti's time until the early 20th century. To conclude my lecture, I wish to play an excerpt from an interview with Adelina De Lara, another pupil of Clara Schumann. Clara Schumann had not only the Schumann tradition to hand on to her pupils, but she had in direct descent the tradition of Bach, Beethoven, and other classics. She numbered among her best friends such masters as Chopin, Mendelssohn, Henselt, Moscheles, and Liszt. She told me how often she had played duets with these great ones and sat by the piano while they played to her their compositions. Well, given what I have been discussing today, one could imagine adding Scarlatti to the list of classics mentioned by Adelina de Lara. This will help you to visualize this continuum of practice as a button changing between musicians belonging to different eras. Thank you for your attention, and I will be glad to answer your question. Well, thank you so much, Julia, for this really wonderful presentation. So much information that I didn't you know, introduce her before. But I mean, I'm really excited by this work because um, my own work, I try to connect music from about the second theater. Just 
Now, in this little studio, I can see a wonderful connection that we made between the recording of the studio um, and uh, I was just back to commenting position because we've got dynamics and what uh, the product was said about commenting playing, and then we're imagining what Scarlett might have expected. Remembering the Scarlett, what uh, well, commenting, of course, what the last word was at the end. Started on the last word and played the last word. Uh, indeed, some of the sonatas are actually published as being for the for the password uh, for the gamut, uh, the great part of the story of the But my question, the excitement about this, is how do we do that? And I know that you're about to also embark on some of the emulation processes. Yes. Would you uh, like to say a little bit about that? Yes. I would like. I'm, I'm very thankful. This is one of the reasons why I'm here, because I wanted to learn this methodology from Neil. And I believe that the only way to really understand what goes on with this historical recording is to emulate them. Because in this way, we not only understand mentally what we are doing, but, but something is going also going on also physically. We have the feeling to embody a different performance style because when we play, we always, always transform our thoughts in gesture. So the emulation brings the tradition or translates the tradition in a more unconscious way. After the emulation, we can then play in the same style other pieces and we can extrapolate backwards in time and move to a previous style integrating in performance when the, the recording can't provide us the information, the information contained in the treatises. And we will realize that all this process is a continuum. It flows constantly from one era to another. I pointed out the word philology, the problem of modern philology, because I believe that in the 19th century, we have cut this tradition, passing from the Baroque into classic, into romantic, and into the beginning of the 19th century. And that's why the historical recordings are so important, because they are, in my opinion, but also more important than mine, in Professor Spereta Costa, they are the key to regain contact with uh, this previous tradition. I just was going to say, I, I absolutely agree. And I think maybe you mentioned the cut back in the, in the 20th century. Yes. Time. But the really interesting thing is to think about what the chronicle said about Clemente uh, and how he was able to write down what he did. And to think about Cunha, because I was thinking, well, I could probably write down what Cunha did, but when it comes to Ivan's shows, I probably couldn't do it so much because she was, I, I always felt she was doing even more than the in terms of these uh, modifications. And so using both of those recordings and perhaps some other ones, you could sort of, as you say, embody a style of playing style that you're not used to doing with, we're much more used to being quite strict, right? And then from there, go back to Clemente, to Gulo, for instance, look at what they've written and become more flexible, take on board all of that, and then, you know, possibly even playing on earlier pianos and even going to pastel. There's so much that can be done. You can learn um, all sorts of different colors and, and things like that, which would undoubtedly uh, fit into the modern. Yes. So that's really exciting. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, opening up questions to the audience. Check one, two. You want me to play some other Scarlatti? Well, it's not scheduled, but I can. <laughs> this time without any switch at the, at the repeat, without the repeats. So I'm going to play one sonata uh, from the Esercizi as well. It's the K13, the G major.
and Scarlatti had a vision in all with crossing heads. I am not so good as it was a few of the other Schmidt saying, so I'm playing in a little way. The same note. Well, I had your same question. It's a question that a couple of days ago I, di I did to Professor Pere da Costa. Uh, my answer, then you will have another one, more uh, prestigious oh, one. But my, my answer was that if you uh, do the emulation just of the mind setting, you will not get it in your body. If you want to embody, the recording, you have really to focus with the score, to annotate, and to try to do as much as you can of it. Because some of the things that you hear, then you will later understand what are they about. It, it seemed a little strange for us musicians which are trained to be always creative to emulate a recording. But I, I've tried myself. And I have experience of performing in concert, training for competition. So I know that it is worth, it's an important journey, 
to understand also in another way how these pianists played. It's another, other feelings, and you can't just control and saying, I'm emulating the mood, I'm emulating what is going on. Of course, you have, you need to have your imagination to see which is the mood, which is leading the interpretation. But the embodiment for me has to be precise. Then, of course. Yeah, well, thank you for making me that all really. The, the whole point is that you can think of it this way you turned up an Arsala, or not Arsala, but a glass cuneo or iron shirts when you were listening to Arsala D. And there were six, so they said, this is my recording, and, and do, you know, do what I do as a starting point. And so that's the point of a lot of people get very scared about, oh, why are we imitating? But actually, we do it all the time. You know, you probably listen to someone with headphones to music and you get high to someone. It's a similar thing. But here, you're really training yourself to imitate very exactly what you want exactly as much as you can, uh, what's going on. And the reason is because we have grown up in the 20th century with a certain way of, we found the playing more of music, right? We play quite cleanly and, and those sorts. This gives us an opportunity to expand and to hear the music in a different way, but also to learn particularly what it's like to do that type of thing. To suddenly rush to a point or to slow down much more than you know you might have thought you were allowed to do. Once you've done that, you can approach uh, these additions, for example, and think about how they might have sounded with all of those extra things that weren't written in the score. You can apply that and then you start again. Going backwards and forwards, you, you do this kind of cyclical thing where you can get yourself back to the Baroque period. We'll never know what's actually happened back then, we don't have the volume, but you'll come up with some new ideas that have moved the mood of the old one from where we are now. I don't know if that makes sense. We have a question. Hi, uh, very interesting, Julia. Um, I, I, I listen to some Horowitz playing Scarlatti, and it seems to me that is the sort of ultimate. And yeah. you're, you're in a similar vein. And what you go for is a high degree of orchestration. So bars one and two are like this, bars three and four are maybe slightly louder, slightly more forward. And then you get a surprise, and it, it's all highly, highly colored and with nuancing, crescendos, all sorts of things. It, it's highly entertaining. And, and basically, I, I don't know what Brahms did or Clara Schumann, but I would imagine what they were trying to do was to make it entertaining and vivid. And that's what you certainly did in the same way as Horvitz. And, and that, that, that's the end of it. I mean, that's what you need to do. Well, yes, uh, we, we happen to have discussed Horowitz with Neil a couple of days ago, and uh, we have agreed that Horowitz is the last of this uh, group of pianists of the past. He has played longer in time, but he's the last one who is conveying a tradition much older. And uh, yes, I think that you have exactly pinpoint the 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 ultimate uh, member of this uh, tradition. And uh, yes, it's about tempo modification, which is 
always surprising and which keeps also fresh, something fresh, something different. I think that we have grown in, in a tradition where a uh, recording system is uh, uh, our model. We, we need to, to deliver an interpretation we can be reproduced. And this is something which makes us very different from the artists of the beginning of the 20th century. That is how I read it. But yes, and in this case, Horowitz has this uh, taste for improvisation that emerged also in the sonatas. And of course, he had a technique that make all these microdynamics changes. But the microdynamic, we can, we can find it, it's prescribed also in Czerny treatise. So that's why I see him like the last of a long tradition. It's also the tempo and the but I think what you're pointing out is that I think what you're saying is you have uh, had the ability to do what are described, but that doesn't just magically happen, it doesn't happen. Um, you know, I would disagree with all of you can just do that actually. It's a sudden thing, it's, he's, he's been doing his reading, he's very talented, of course, he's good, he has the chops to do it, but it also takes thinking and Yes. Yes, absolutely. I'm getting the wind up from Anthony. So, in terms of the interpretive style of what you could do, I actually find it quite surprising in in how those 19th century and 20th century recordings, before the dynamic and discursive markings, they produce a very sort of there's a lot of visual. Well, as, as I said, the um, critical edition of Baroque score, they, they reproduce the manuscripts. And in the manuscripts, there is no indication. What does that mean? Does it really mean that Baroque players don't add any expression to these scores? Because if you have to stick to the score, you should add nothing, no colors no accentuations, no slabbing, nothing. While this Baroque music is, in Baroque music, it's a tradition which were transmitted orally from players to players. Players were also composers, were also writing treatises. So they were passed by, passing the transmission, it was passing by hand, the, tra the tradition from one to the other. And uh, this liberty, this freedom that they had is extraordinary. If you read the treatise by Paolo da Milano, which speaks about, there is a description of a lute player of the 16th century, and you can really see how the, the playing was almost a rhapsodic playing. So we can't imagine that Baroque music uh, was meant to be played in a very strict way. Of course, it had some rules, the tactus and uh, many other things that you but can... Maybe just to also point out that you can, you can read about this and actually more importantly hear it. The early 20th century, between 1900 and about 1950, there was a complete rejection of the 19th century and the late 19th century practices. It came with modernism, and the modernist way of viewpoint was <laughs> Change of rhythm, ornamentation, individualization, 
sometimes people completely recompose the music as a Bulo, Bulo de Campo. I, I, it's really interesting, Bulo de Campo, because I was going to say this to you. Could that be what Scarlatti actually expected as well? Well, probably with different style, but the extent of the modification may have not been shocking for him. If, but, uh, uh, an example, very simple. Uh, I don't know if you are a pianist, but uh, we generally play uh, the English Suite by Bach. If you take the Sarabande and you see Les Agrements de la Sarabande, the alternative reading of the Sarabande, these are the embellishment that Bach suggests for this music. Well, it's rewriting this music. And the extent of this modification says a lot about the degree of uh, liberty or freedom that uh, performance would have in Baroque era. Well, we probably do need to finish there. And I'd like to talk about coming up to the end of the next video, but I also. But special thanks to Julia for coming all the way from Australia.